And give me just a minute here. Pop out chat. And bingo. Okay, welcome. Hope just did not want to wait a daggum second, did you? Okay, now like I was trying to say before I got a little couple of uh, golden eyeballs poking up at me. Today we're going to try and hopefully get a broadcast done without it being shut down in the middle of it. And today's subject matter is actually going to be, as noted in the title below, Moalan Bone Binder. Yes, another necromancer. In this case, though, he's intended for a project I'm working on. That's my next Kickstarter. I said Kickstarter, not Kitty Starter. Really? Okay, fuzzball. I'm gonna have to put you on the floor, okay? Ugh. Ugh. It puts you on the floor because you mm. okay since almost all of you are watching this after the fact don't forget the whole like subscribe bell icon bit and he's so feral isn't he He's just such a wild, untamed, savage little kitty. I, I'm going to be putting you on the floor now, okay? Because i got to get stuff done. Let's get that claw out of my shirt. That's another thing. His claw control is amazing. He can claw my shirt without ever once touching the skin underneath. All right, come on, little buddy. Let's go down there. All right, go on and go. Now, the concept behind Moel and Bonebinder is that he will have an actual encounter written for him. In this encounter, first of all, he has minions. These minions are not your typical zombie, skeleton, ghoul, no. His minions are specters and other ephemeral undead. Okay? And you encounter him while he's working on the final aspect of the ritual for him to become a lich. To be exact, four sacrifices. All four of them die, he succeeds and becomes a lich, and there will be a lich version of him. If none of them die, he dies. If a couple of them die, oh, then weird things happen. He becomes a botched lich with strange aspects to him. Neither alive nor a lich. And constantly in torments. Anyway, before I give away everything I planned for him, um, what that means is there's going to be two versions of the figure. One as a human, and one as a lich. So, without further ado, let me go ahead and uh, show you how I'll be handling that. This is, of course, my default base figure. You know, we got him rotating around. And what'll happen is, after I've got him posed with all of his equipment and gear and stuff, not only will I be exporting the base default figure like this, I'll also be exporting a version like that. That will be under all of the same equipment and gear and so on and so forth. And then torn bits added to some of the some of the clothing, but not all. 
Okay, so for the first thing we need to do is he's going to be wearing a robe. So he needs to have the robe skirt. And most of the other aspects of what he's wearing is going to be extruded from him or his robe. Um, let's see what else should, should we put on him. Mm, I don't think we need pauldrons or any of those. Actually, let me go ahead. That's that's too much of a robe. Let's use this version of the robe. His boots will be will be showing. Um. He will be having a staff, but we're going to be doing something with that staff. It'll be in his right arm. And then we're going to hide the robe and him. File, export. Bows, necromancer. This will be... What did I... Wow, one... Staff, accept, and then cutting over here. File, import, mm, beer, meshes, legendary foes, necromancer, Moal and staff, import. Okay, this is the default staff. Now, before I do anything else, first of all, let me change this color to something a bit more actually colorful so that it's easier to see on the screen as distinct from whatever I have selected which as you can see selecting it turns the wireframe white so now it's green now I can tell the next is I'm actually going to be coming back to here because I'm gonna be searching through ideas from my uh, uh, reference image directory and I'd really rather not have my reference image, images be, you know, bandied about simply because I don't have the copyrights for these things. And I am not copying them. Instead, I'm getting ideas for shapes and for decorate, decorative types and things like that. Obviously, a skull is a bit too on the nose. You, know, you want to try and be interesting without being exact, you know. Uh, don't think an axe would work for him. Um, let's see, nor spear. A crystal is, again, a bit too on the nose. Too classic, too generic. Hmm, mixing that with that and that. Gotta remember that. And... Yeah, that'll do. Okay, so I'm gonna close these. The ideas are in my, are percolating in my little, little itty bitty brain. And back to 3D Studio Max. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to delete the sphere on top. The imperfect sphere, I should note. Is that? Yeah, that's that. Delete. Now we select there. And we're going to collapse it. And we're going to select here. Loop. We're going to chamfer just a little bit. 0 0.001. Just to help keeping it from being squished. Okay, this is going to be the shaft of the staff. Now, the next thing that's going to come is, first of all, we need to make sure we've got the X and the Y down. File, import, on staff, park. Okay, object scale one. That was a problem. 
so once again we delete that change the color select the edge there and collapse I shouldn't say edge I should say border the open a border in, in term in 3ds max is an open edge loop loop chamfer 0 0.001 there now this is x negative 13.465 and z 15.573 now we're going to go to cylinder we're going to create his staff let's start it here I'm going to bring it out so it's about here. We want it overlapping and intersecting. We only want three height, but two cap, and we want the sides down to 10. And then we're going to make it just a bit taller. Wish it was a little bit taller. Wish it was a baller. All right. Now we're going to convert it to edible poly. Then we're going to make sure to have the uh, bring it up to the top row of colors because it's brighter. All right, thirteen point four six five becomes thirteen point four six. Yeah. Okay, and then fifteen point five seven three. Hmm. I was off by 0.2 in each direction. That's pretty accurate. Then what we're going to do is we're going to select outer ridges loop and we're going to make them wider then we're going to chamfer not quite that much but almost I forgot to hit OK. Then we're going to select here and here to there. And with those select still selected, we're going to chamfer them 0 0.001 with 2. Now, we're going to mesh smooth it. 1, 2. Oh, 1, 2. Okay. Now the next thing we're going to do is we need a hand. So we're going to hide this. And we're going to load in what would be the best hand to use in this situation. Let's go ahead, go back to my miniature base TF page. Let's load in my giant figure. Now let's select him. All right, base giant. Expand from selected. Select all the way to the right forearm. Parameters. All visible off. And then from the left collar to the other arm. Off. There. Now. I'm going to rotate it this way and then okay now frame and the hand itself, we're going to bend back. And we're going to start using this to kind of basically make it a nice opening wide. Sphere. Oh, 
or around the sphere. And then we're going to select all the finger parts. We're going to bend them. And this is going to end up being sculpted into. Let's twist this one. Just to check, let's go ahead and create new primitive sphere. And then go to the right view. Okay, the sphere needs to be made smaller. About there. We need to move it into the hand maybe made a little bit bigger then in the back view we can go ahead and bring it into the hand let's move it a bit more there and make it a little bit bigger perspective view Okay, we need this finger brought in a bit more. Now let's straighten the pinky out a little bit in this finger and bring it in a bit more here. And obviously we're going to end up sculpting the details that we want when it comes time. All right. Now, here we have the hand holding the orb. And we're going to export this as orb hand. Accept. And then I'm going to delete the basic giant and the Okay, go back to 3D Studio Max, File, Import, Orb Hand, Import. And while we're here, we're going to once again select that. But instead of directly coll uh, collapsing it, we're going to convert to edible, we're going to convert to vertex. We're going to go to Soft Selection. Is right now closed. If we open it, use soft selection, uh, edge distance because we don't want it to affect the sphere at all. We want that to stay as much of a sphere as possible. We're going to shrink it a bit so that we can fit this into the staff area. Uh, let's affect, let's make that bubble a little bit less and the fall off a little bit more because it needs to be and then there we go now we're going to go back to that we're going to turn off soft selection and we're going to since it's on edge instead of border, we can chamfer. We're going to chamfer 0 0.01, no, 0 0.02. We're going to make it two edge segments. 
We're then going to select only the border and collapse it. Okay, now we need to move it over to here, rotate it, and move it over here. Then we're going to scale it down quite a lot. Okay, bring that over, put it into there. Need to shrink it down a bit more. And once again, we need to change the color. Make it Now, this is what we currently have for that staff. Uh, I think I need to move it over to the right just a little, little bit more. And then I also think we need to rotate it a bit like that. Considering that he'll be holding it diagonally, that would do. Okay, so now we take that file. File, not edit. Export selected. Wavefront OBJ. Meshes, legendary bows, bows, necromancer, Moellen staff. Yes. Export. Done. Delete. And we go back to Dash Studio, where we now take this and delete it. Let's make him visible again. File, import. Legendary Bows, Bows, Necromancer, Moel, and Staff. Yeah, accept. Okay, now we're going to the back view, selecting the Moel and Staff, and we're going to need to move it a little bit because it's not quite in the right spot. There. Perspective view. And now we're going to parent it to the right hand. We're going to hide it because now it's time to do the pose. Okay, do we have anybody in? No, we don't. Okay, now I'm going to stand to, to, to play around with taking the pose just to see what it would be. Okay, so hip will be rotating and tilting. That way, a little bit forward, but not a lot. Okay. Now, that'll be rotating that way, tilting like that, and tilting forward. Okay, now we're going to rotate. We're going to bring the leg forward a little bit. out a little bit. Now we're going to bring this leg down a little bit. Now comes the tricky part. The chest and the waist. I decide this side to side this way. Twist like that. And then we're gonna kinda of pull this shoulder back. Okay. What's going to happen next is we're going to go ahead and pin the feet. A 
lock the side to side for the shins. And we're going to bring the torso or the hips. We're going to rotate the hips a bit more forward. Okay, now unpin all. Now we're going to go ahead and pin translation and rotation on the hip. Content library. Props. Mm, no, that one poses. Left fist. There we go. Now what's going to happen is we're going to rotate this leg forward. Parameters. Let's make sure it's got no bend. And we are going to grab this fist and pull. Well, let's take that forearm. No side to side. Lock it. No, not that one. That one. Whoa. No. There we go, got a bit of a triumphant pose. We're going to have to tweak the feet in just a moment. Let me go ahead and unpin all. And now we're going to tweak the neck. Obviously, part of this will be <coughs> tweaked. I'm going to go ahead and hit Control D to drop it to the ground. Just peek at the robe. Yep. Now let's do the feet. Front view. I'm going to go ahead and rotate slightly, bend up. I'm going to go side to side a little. Unbend the toe.
and I hit control D to drop them down. Now we're going to check the right shin, make sure we've got no bend. Now hip, let's pin it again. And let's pull that foot down just a bit. There we go. And here we have the pose from Wellen Bone Bender. And just to show you what it will look like. Although the robe won't shift with him when he does this. Okay. We get a little bit of soda pop and we'll go on to the sculpting. It is now 8.05. We've been at it 35 minutes. Alright, so first things first, hide the robe, hide the staff. File, export, Moala and body. Accept. File, export, Moala staff. Yes. Accept. And you'll notice I'm not putting a base on him. That's because he'll have a custom base made later on. File, export, Moalan robe, accept. File, export. Oh wait, not yet. Try undead. File export. Oh well, and corpse. Except. <laughs> Excuse me, I got the hiccups. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and just briefly pop back to here. Because um, once again, I'm talking. Hold on just a second. Uh, sorry about this. All right. All right, sorry about that. Okay. Now, we're going to go ahead and head over to ZBrush. And we start this off by importing from the legendary pose, pose necromancer Moalan body. Um, then we're going to append. Let's make it insert. 
polymesh 3d import well in robe oh yeah i need to edit and insert polymesh 3d import while in staff insert polymesh 3d import while in corpse you can see how where he overlaps because of the different colors we're going to turn him off for right now because what we're going to do next is going to involve the body and unlike usual we're not going to have the clothing fuse into the body because we are going to be needing to swap it out for the corpse so what we're going to do is we're going to hide everything and i am going to use the move tool i'm also going to turn on draw size per brush make it a little bit bigger and then we're going to kind of pull it in just a bit down here kind of straighten out that particular part of the body from this pose it would not be quite so um, dramatic we're also going to do the same thing with the undead version okay Bing. Now, we go to geometry and we're going to subdivide it a few times, delete lower, and then Dynamesh 768. Okay. The robe, we're also going to geometry subdivide it a few times. And before we do anything else, we're going to kind of pull out the, the wedgie that uh, Mo Allen seems to have. Bring this down, bring it into there. Bring it into there. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add like a waist plate that will fuse into the robe. We're going to mark it off on the default geometry. With the tablet, with the tablet. Okay, days. We get a sub tool, select him. Look over here, see if anyone's joining in. Hello, Omerta Primal. Finally got at least somebody in the audience tonight. I know I've been having friends, having, having connection issues for the past couple weeks, but I mean, I am trying. All right, so we're going to mark off. Well, first we've got to turn the, when I hit control, put that focal shift over. We're also going to turn on transparency so I can see where the you know, border is and go over that. This is going to end up fusing with the robe and not the body. Now I'm going to shrink this down a little bit so I can do a more detailed upper portion. And it's going to come all the way up to there. And down here, it's going to come up like a peak in the back, which means we are going to end up removing some of this masking before we expand, before we extract it. And we're just going to kind of come like that, and then like that. Okay. Turn off transparency, zoom out. Then we're going to go down to extract. And we're going to go to 0 0.015, extract, 
except we're going to draw to get rid of the masking on it. Then we're going to select him and we're going to draw to get rid of the masking on him. That's control draw, by the way. Now, we're going to divide this a couple more times because it needs to be at least 150 to 200,000. That'll do. And now this, we're going to Dynamesh at 256. And then subdivide it once, twice, delete lower. And then going to merge down into that robe. We go to geometry, change the dynamesh to 768, dynamesh. And now we're going to smooth over the seams. Has anyone else noticed a trend for action video game characters from the 90s and the oddies turning into dads? I don't mean the archetype turning into a, uh, a turning into a dad. You know, the most common archetype being dad. I mean, B.J. Blaskovitz breaks down and cries in his last Wolfenstein game because he won't be there to raise his daughters or is terrified of not raising his daughters. The entirety of God of War, the reboot, is uh, Kratos trying to get close to his son. Okay, now we're going to grow that uh, mask. When it grows, it does so in a blurred way, so always hit sharpen mask two or three times after you've grown it a few times. Make sure, okay, yeah, that's gonna be good. That's gonna be his basic belt. Now this is gonna look very simple right now. But we're going to be adding details to it as time goes on, so don't worry. And right now, it kind of looks like a prom, you know, a, a a a strapless prom dress. I know, but there's there's going to be more. In fact, the next thing is going to be his pauldrons. Okay. First thing we do is we're going to go back to the standard brush just so I can shrink it down. And we're going to draw on the side arm armor. All right. It's also going to include a piece that comes up here. All right. And then the gap between them is going to be covered by the larger full pauldron. But before we do, okay, we need to really trim that. That's too much there. And again, before we need, we need to sharpen the edges of it, corners, stuff like that, like here, and here, and a little bit here, that's that arm. Now we're going to do it on the other arm. Let's frame out. Yeah. 
let's start here. Okay, I'm down all the way to here. And then we're going to put armor here. We're going to make this one just one piece just to make things simpler. And then we're going to trim off to sharpen these corners. Yes, he's wearing pauldrons over cloth. They're for decoration, so bleh. In fact, they're going to be the kind of pauldrons that no one would wear if they were ever actually wanting to use them as armor. Okay, now we're going to extract them at 0 0.02. Accept. Draw. And then draw to get rid of the masking on them. We're now going to go to geometry and zebra mesher. Zebra mesher. Adaptive size 100. Polygon count half. Deep edge creases. Zebra mesher. Going from 34,000 active points to 17. We're going to do it again. And again, and again, and again, one more time. There. Now the reason why we did it this way was it keeps the creases real sharp and it loses things like that crease that was right there. Now we're going to subdivide it back to normal, which will be about 33,000 because we're going to be adding some detail to it later. Okay, now we go back to our main body. We turn on transparency so we can see through where these are. And we're going, it's time to create the actual pauldrons. Now, these pauldrons are going to come down all the way to here. And it's going to come out and make like that. It's going to come down to there, come back up again. We're making pointy fang like structures on our pauldron. Then we're going to go ahead and with a control alt remove that which prevents us from having sharp points. this detail okay now we're going to do a different one on this arm simply because asymmetry is cool a little bit of a spherical bits here and then we're going to come down to a single point. I'm going to come across this way to make sure that's covered up. And come up like that. Oh, 
Okay. We're going to erase just enough to make it pointed. But here we're going to come from this side. Over here. Okay, now we're going to come, come down, frame out, turn off. We're going to change the thickness to 0 0.04. Extract, accept, draw, draw. And when we look, we see it's got a nice look to it. We're going to use move tool and Reduce the size of it just a bit. Oh, no, we need to make it back to full size. We're going to grab where it meets the chest and pull it in. Just enough, just to pull it in. Okay, and this one. This will... Now. That's our pauldrons. And let's see how it looks with the undead version. Okay, good. It still looks like it fits. We might need to tweak the back here, but we're going to do that on the figure, not on the armor. And here and a little bit up here okay yep undead alive undead alive okay mark no sound? Why not? The idea is that this will be a necromancer, but that necromancer will have both a living and a dead version. The dead version obviously being a lich of some kind. Okay, now we're going to take this and merge down. That the pauldrons are one piece. We're then going to tool, not tool, um, stroke, pop over, and, okay, lazy mouse off, curve functions, frame mesh. You'll notice this put a whole lot of, oh wait, no, turn off frame. Let's uh, turn off the frame. Well, let's turn to curve tube and shrink it down. There. Now we've got two um, polygroups. Auto group. Now we go to frame mesh and we only get the outside edges instead of the groups. Now we need to make this, first of all, depth, okay, depth of zero should be good. That's a bit too much. One, two. Still too much. That's good, and then put it on here. Yeah. So we go back to subtool and split that off. Split unmasked points. Split unmasked points. Split unmasked points. Split unmasked points. Now you'll notice this means that there's a couple areas where the trim below reaches it. So what we got to do first, we're going to turn off that. 
Now, we're going to merge all the trim together. Then we're going to go to Move Topological. Make it a bit bigger. And we're going to grab here and pull it down into the pauldron. Same thing here. We're going to grab this and we're going to pull it down into the pauldron so it's not visible. Uh, okay. Now we're going to grab this one and we're going to kind of pull it forward. Grab this one, kind of pull it this way. I'm going to bring it up. That's because we need to fuse that into one bat, one one line. It's frame out full scale, full scale, and we need to subdivide it a bit, and then dynamesh it at let's say two fifty six. No, not enough. Let's say 512. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to kind of blend that. There we go. And there's our trim. Now obviously it's going to need detailing on the surface of the plates. Okay, let me get some soda. Next up is going to be some chains. What, you thought he was going to have pansy little leather straps? No, he's not chained. He might be a necromancer, but he's a buff necromancer. So, I have created an insert mesh chain. Where did I put it? There it is. Now, just to show you. Chain. see obviously we need to shrink it down a good bit and we're going to turn on transparency and we're going to grab from here no i don't know first of all we need to grab from here to there and once again split unmasked points Click once to get rid of the existing. And we're going to go from here to there. Split unmasked points. Click here to get rid of that. As you can see, he's got a couple chains connecting those two now. Now we're going to do something for the back. Let's go ahead and grab from here. Right. Yeah. We're going to grab from here. To there, split on mass points, and then from here to there, split on mass points. Now, obviously, we're going to have to move some of this, so we're going to go to move, not move topological, because we don't want to split this chain apart. <coughs> okay, this one. We're going to have to grab it and kind of pull it just a bit there. We just want to make sure that it looks like it's going completely under. This one. I'm going to pull there. Okay. Now, this one. I'm going to grab and pull it under there. This last one, however. We're going to need to make it a little bit bigger. Because we're going to need to move this whole thing up. And then it's good there. Now, we're going to merge those chains down. And we need to make them bigger. By that, I mean we need to inflate them. And once we do that, yeah. We want to make sure that it's going into the body. 
because that's how we make sure that it's going to be printed well. We don't want to be able to see the underside of the links. It'll be fused with the body when it prints. Okay. There's our chains there. Now we're going to add a couple just for the heck of it chains. All right. Go back to him. Go back to the chain. We're going to make it a little bit bigger. And we're going to go from with transparency on. Go from under here to there. And then split unmasked points. Get rid of the thing. And then from here, we're going to come down back up. Split unmasked points. Okay, that did not work well. Okay, now. Let me show you a special function of ZBrush in the current edition. The curve ended there. I can continue it. There we go. Now we're going to merge those. All right, that. Yeah, that needs to die. Okay. Merge down. And now we go to move. And we're going to move that whole thing back under because we don't need it doing anything. That'll get absorbed into the body. We're going to kind of move these in a little bit so when it comes time to inflate them, they'll inflate properly. Okay, now let's frame out. And we're going to inflate them. Deformation, inflate, and then just. There we go. We have our chains. He now he's going to need detailing on the robe. He's going to need some kind of bracers. And he's going to need something on his head. Now, obviously, any hair I give him will not be present on the undead version. Okay. Did I lose you guys? No, you're still watching. Okay, just just checking. All right. Now. All right, we're a little over halfway through tonight. As you can tell, it's probably not going to get finished tonight. But this way you'll at least get a preview of one of the uh, baddies in my upcoming set. Alright, so for this arm, this arm is going to have the bigger bracer. Yes, I do tend to put the bigger bracer on the offhand. But in this case, it's because the other hand has the staff, so this hand needs something to promote, to, to attract attention. Okay, let's switch back to standard. This is going to get extracted at point zero three. Except draw. Now we're going to rotate it so as flat as possible. We're going to there.
0.025. Similar, but almost. Okay, first things first. Let's mask the hand back, and then we're going to visibility hide points. That'll hide the points that aren't part of the back of the hand. Then to geometry, modify topology, delete hidden. Now we can turn the uh, bracer back on and then turn him back on. Frame out. And once again, we're going to check to see what it looks like in the uh, fleshless version. Okay, good. Yeah. So y'all like them what you're seeing so far? This wrist is just going to get a nice tight little bracelet on this arm. Okay, we go to extract. We turn off double and make that 0 0.04. Accept. Draw. And then when we have him visible, yeah. Now what's going to happen is we're going to geometry. We're going to dynamesh it at 512. Then we're going to deformation it and we're going to polish it 100 times. And then again. And then again. And then again. And then... Okay, that doesn't help. All right, now we're going back to geometry. We're going to dynamize it at 128. We're going to polish it here. Go back to geometry and subdivide it a couple times. And now we're going to Dynamesh it, I'm gonna polish it again. Because there's an area right in here. Yeah. Frame out. And once again, we're gonna see what it looks like in the corpse spot. Okay, good. Nothing need be changed. That is it. Well, besides detailing the body and the corpse body and adding on his stringy hair, his balding stringy hair and his human face wrinkles. Okay. Now, brief pause here. It's, we got 45 minutes left in tonight's broadcast. If I end on time, I might not be able to. Hmm. So, what's going to happen is, first of all, apparently I'm about to get ambushed by a Carlton, so I better put this up so it doesn't get damaged. Now, tonight's broadcast is just showing how, by saving two versions of a character out and making sure the clothing and equipment is separate, I can make two versions of the same character. I could do the same thing for making a wolfman, and by that I don't mean the full hybrid form half wolf. I mean like the, you know, the almost Scotty Dog Terrier look that the uh, 1930s version had. You know, you just do the same thing. You just have 
you just go in and, and make the collar different and did y'all miss him tell the truth did y'all miss him Snuffles. Hmm? yeah Duffle, duffle, duffle. Anyway, that's just the basic shapes that his clothing will have. There will be additional detail. Yeah. Can I? Can I put you down? Can I put you down? On the floor, I mean. <sighs> really? Apparently that means yes, really. No, 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 do not bite my button. Get, get your lips off that button. No. No. All right. Down onto the floor you go. Come on down. Go. Oh, that's not the button. That's the button hole. Either way. Now, just to show you what I've gotten done so far for this. Of course, most of you have seen the unfinished paint job as of yet on the Frost Chimera. Then comes the unfinished paint job as of yet. Greater Feldrake. Yes, this impl implies that there are lesser Feldrakes. The unfinished paint job as of yet. Storm Wyvern. Yes, he's blue for a reason. And then the primed but not painted at all Minotaur Minions. Again, some of you may have already seen this because I sculpted these live on the on the uh, channel. And the not even primed Morkron Great Horn, the Minotaur Lord. And for comparison in size, here's one of the minions. You see, Morkrun is at least a head taller. And his axe has a larger and slightly tilted head. And is overall slightly larger. Length of the handle is slightly greater, it's slightly thicker, etc., etc. Now, as the title says, I'm working on Moellan Bonebinder. And his minions, as a necromancer, are not zombies, skeletons, ghouls, you know. No, no. He's an ephemeral, which means his minions are ghosts and specters. And then, finally, once that's done, the last epic foe for the initial package is an evil prime minister, with his minions being soldiers of the army. Or Castle Guard. Once I have those done, painted, and printed, photographs done, I'll be starting the Kickstarter and then starting work on the stretch goals, which I may or may not hit. I hope I do. There's going to be a lot of stretch goals. It's not going to be like the last time where there was like two or three. No, this is going to be each additional epic foe is a stretch goal. So they're going to be a lot closer together and there's going to be a lot more of them. Uh, for example, there's a one of the one of the uh, stretch goals is a blue dragon who is secretly the controlling force between two enemy criminal organizations that are at war with each other. And she's kicking back just watching and laughing. There's uh, a werewolf with a human form figure 
half, the quarter form figure with, like I mentioned, the Scotty Dog look, and the full wolf man with clothing and detailing in common. Of course, the full wolf man will only have things like his necklace, shredded version of his pants, <clears throat> and an armband or two, and minions that are themselves Scotty Dog, Wolfmen, and hybrid wolf, Wolfmen. Uh, there's going to be an evil warlord with his soldiers, and the soldiers, both for him and the Prime Minister, are going to have ball and socket joint arms, like what I did for the city guard test over on Thingiverse, and the arms are going to be interchangeable. So you could use the, the torsos for the city guard or the enemy soldiers interchangeably in the arm, like if you want to use that mace, that, that really wicked mate looking mace that the bad guys have on the on the city guard, there you go. Uh, I'm considering one of the weapons for the city guard being what's called a bar mace. If you don't know what a bar mace is, look it up. It's pretty it's pretty cool. But the point is, there's a lot of them. Once it's all done and I've hit the end, I'm also going to be collecting into a single PDF an encounter book with all of these characters and creatures. For example, the Greater Feldrake. The idea is that Feldrakes are somewhat similar to my hunting drake that I, I did on Thingiverse several years or a couple years ago in that they were bred deliberately for use as hunting animals by the super rich. The problem is that they're extremely hard to control and they tend to go feral pretty easily. And when they go feral, every so often they'll be born a greater Feldrake. And when that happens in captivity, the greater Feldrakes are culled while they're still hatchlings. In the wild, they take over the, the uh, pack. And uh, the greater Feldrakes are size huge. The regular Feldrakes are size large and quadruped instead of bipedal. And so there would be an encounter with a pack of Feldrakes and led by a greater Feldrake. Storm Wyvern is actually related to the story that's going to be going on for the Blue Dragon in that Storm Wyverns are what happens when Blue Dragons experiment on Wyverns, increasing their intelligence and giving them elemental abilities, and obviously, the, in this case, electrical. Imagine a Wyvern that's size huge instead of size large and has a special attack. Once per short rest, it can do a full-on body block into a target. And when it hits, not only does it do this you know, serious physical impact oomph, but it detonates a burst of lightning, 20-foot radius, that does serious electrical damage all around it. Just... <laughs> what? I didn't wake you, did I? Baby girl. So yeah, things like that. Um, the story of Morkrun Greathorn, Minotaur whose clan was annihilated by hordlings, so he had his brother, a shaman, he, the two were the only survivors, forged the skin of the hordlings into an armor that generated fear, then killed his brother, took over an, a rival clan, and is working on an empire. Etc. The blue dragon will be female. It will be lounging, and in its paw, take a cauldron and a pillar attached to the bottom of the cauldron, and fill it with a with a, with several gallons of red wine. Yes, indeed. It'll be a long, slender blue instead of the big, muscle-bound, massive linebacker that the Blues have been for a while. <clears throat> because the Blues have always been described as being the cunning, planning, trap-making Slytherins of the Dragons. Now, 
you know, where the Reds were the D and D barbarians of, of the evil dragons, and the Whites were just stupid rampaging beasts. The Greens were just kind of xenophobic. The Blacks were. Uh, I'm, I'm an evil dragon. I'm not as stupid as a white, but <laughs> I don't make plans. I just attack. The blues were like, oh, long-term plans, eh? 1,500 years is no big deal for a, for a decent plan. Hmm. Major Domo, um, send this message to that organization and send this message to that one. On second thought, swap it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, for those who don't know, the one that just woke up is my baby girl Shinju. Um, they're now some of the uh, foes are humans or humanoids. Like uh, Morkrun, like Moalan that we've been sculpting on tonight, and a few others. Some of the foes are creatures like Dorm Wyvern, Greater Feldrake, and the Frost Chimera, who is larger and smarter than their classic versions, their classic variant cousins. Um. All of these figures will have a separate textured base. In the case of the Frost Chimera, the intent is that it represents like rocks sticking up out of snow. The Feldrake and the Storm Wyvern have just a generic rocky terrain underneath them. The Minotaurs, however, have flagstone cobblestone floors on their base, either for underground highly refined construction or for their attacking a town. Things like that. Which is why there is no base yet for our uh, little guy here. Because he's going to have his own original custom base. And I just realized, you can see him saying, Show must go on. It's like the Freddie Mercury. i got to make sure not to give him a Freddie Mercury mustache, because that would be bad. Anyway. But yeah, once I've gotten to the point, okay, the Kickstarter's over. I know how, how many is going to be. There's going to be a PDF for free. The PDF will be free, independent of any purchase or backing of the setup. PDF of all of these guys. Yep. So what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. This way, if you want to just run the encounters, you can do that. Go ahead. Have the have have the have the book. Have the idea. Have the uh, campaign and encounter ideas. They're free. If you want to print the figures, buy the STLs. Back to Kickstarter, because that's how I. Backing the Kickstarter and backing my Patreon, which is Patreon's down there, is how I am able to keep doing this instead of having to put it all up and set it aside and go get a day job. Now, as you can see, when it comes to critters, I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of decent when it comes to making critters that actually look like living things. You know, look like they've actually got an anatomy under there instead of just being you know Draco from Dragonheart <sighs> ooh 
that one was had some problems. Or the dragon from Shrek. Um, but I've had more experience actually, paradoxically, sculpting humanoid figures like these guys. Yes, they're not humanoid technically, but the techniques I made used to make their armor, their weapons, and their pose are the same techniques that I use in regular human figures. Ugh. I really should get around to painting this guy here in a little bit. Well, him and his boss and his cousin. Pink. Now I know it's only been an hour and a half. I know I only worked on him for an hour and 15. I'm probably going to be ending soon because what a lot of you don't know for the past couple weeks, not only have I been having connection issues because Comcast is being a little, you know, wishy-washy. Yeah, I'll, I'll work. No, I won't. I'll work. No, I won't. I'll work. No, I won't. I've also been taking care of my mother is currently in a long-term, or not long-term, short-term nursing home for physical therapy. My brother recently had a heart attack. And I'm taking care of him, his dog, my mother, and... So I'm kind of scattering back and forth across town. So uh, I'll probably be ending the, the shows a little bit early and without having finished my sculpts. The sculpts will get finished. They get, they'll get finished after the fact. You know, uh, I hate to say this, but until I have time to actually just take my time with my shows again, my older episodes up until about a month or two ago. I finish all the figures in them because I can do it. I can't right now. And for that I apologize. I will show the finished versions in the Discord and once I print them out and at least start work on painting them I'll show them on the uh, broadcasts. He's got kind of a yellow belly. But as you can see, I haven't even started on things like the eyes, the inner mouth, the horns, the claws, the talons, the base. So much to do. And before I go, do you want to see my secret on dry brushing? Something that does an unimaginably good job with dry brushing. That it's light years ahead of actually using a brush. You know, instead of using this. An old ratty brush. Go out. Take yourself to your local Walgreens or Walmart. And buy yourself... set of makeup brushes. These things are so soft. And you know, just do that a couple times, you'll get rid of one you'll get a hair shed, but oh well. These things are so soft, they're rounded that the end result once you've done a dry brush with them is literally better than anything you ever expected. It, instead of having a dusty look with, if you do it too much, you end up with almost like layering, it's a smooth blend. It's surprisingly good. And they're n not that expensive. I mean, yeah, going out and getting yourself a nice, moderately expensive individual brush from your local uh like this was a four dollar brush from michael's i mean it's not high end but it's it's not low end either and it's nice and soft and this is going to be a really good detail brush for ten dollars 
I got me all of these for dry brushing. Even for small areas on, in, on character models. Getting into some of the harder to reach areas. And then larger areas up to critters. So yeah. You know, that's six brushes for about ten bucks. And they last, as long as you, once again, take care of them, they last a decently long while. Now you got to be careful. Some of them, like this one, the ferrule is part of the handle. It doesn't have a separate actual ferrule piece. It's got a little groove cut into the handle to hold on to, but the, the, it's one plastic piece, which means that the bristles can come out easier. Anyway. 905, gone and done everything I need to do. I need to go ahead and head on out because I gotta go take my brother's dog out for walkies and make sure that my sister-in-law and my brother don't need anything done. Oh, one last thing. I'm gonna show you a picture. Add source. Media file. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum, bum. This is my current paint setup. All right, this right here, this rack, which is, you know, this rack right here. Each row of paint on the uh, on these shelves, well, except for the citadels, the top shelf, is actually two rows. I mean, let me go ahead and I remove. This bottle and this bottle, you can see there was a row of paint hiding behind them. See? There are 42 bottles per shelf on this rack. Now, let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, five full. So 5 times 42 is 210 bottles. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 16. 226 bottles of Viejo Army Painter and Warcolor Paint. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 bottles of Citadel. Mm -hmm. On this little rack. As you may or may not be able to see in the background, I've got a second rack I haven't put up. Mm -hmm. Now, do you know how much that rack cost me on uh, Amazon? $19. $19 to hold, if I had nothing but the Citadel and Army Color and War Color paints, that's six times forty-two. Two hundred and fifty-two bottles of paint per rack. One rack. I mean, yeah, this is good. I can see the paint color. I can tell that this is a pale yellow before I even pull it out. Yeah, it's called moon dust. And I can tell that this is a bright orange and it's called lava orange, yeah. And this is a this is an ochre. Oh look, heavy ochre. But 200 bottles. Now, if I only had Citadel, now you'll notice it only take it'll only take about 15 bottles per shelf. Which means instead of 252, it'll only hold 1530. About 90 bottles of Citadel paint. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. So yeah. 
90 versus 250. And the funny thing is, these bottles, compared to, oh, no, don't do that. Oh, my back. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, let's just get this one. This one's easier to reach. These bottles hold 12 milliliter. 12. Mm-hmm. These bottles hold 17. You can hold more of these on here than you can of these because of their large squat shape. Yay. Anyway, it's now 10 after. I'm going to go ahead and uh, this. I'm going to go ahead and do my usual say goodbye Gracie type thing. I'm going to hold my hand up here. Well, I'm going to scratch my nose. Yee. I am going to count from five to one. I'm going to get to one. I'm going to say something deep, profound, funny, or ridiculous, and then go, eh, 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 eh. I'm going to see my finger going, eh, 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 eh. I log out. And that'll be it for the night. Alrighty. So, that's going to be a five. Four. Whoa. Five. Four. Three. One. No. Two. Two. One. Did you know that a lot of false facts are prefaced by, did you know? Good night. <laughs>